Good morning, Greenwich. It's 9.30 on Wednesday, and that means it's time to talk with me, Jen Graziano. I'm the co-owner of Cox and Graziano Funeral Home, located at 134 Hamilton Avenue. And as part of my family's commitment to the community, I come to you every Wednesday talking to people that matter, about things that matter, in a place that matters, right here in Greenwich. So quite appropriate today that we're going to be talking about the new proposed toll that they want to send down from Hartford right here to the Greenwich, New York border. And my guest is stuck in traffic, Representative Fred Camillo, who will be calling in momentarily. But Fred is going to talk to us about the proposed uh, toll, the proposed gas tax, and so many things going up, going on in Hartford that impact us on the local level. And welcome to all of our Facebook Live viewers this morning. Thank you for tuning in. Fred will take any questions and comments directly to the line. Bob, do we have anybody on the line? Not yet. Okay, so what we're going to just... Give you a little background for those who might not be aware. There is a new proposed toll that will be going by the New York Connecticut border somewhere around exit two. And there is, as you can imagine, lots of uproar about that. Will it only be on I-95? No, it will not. It's oh. kind of a statewide toll thing, but at the very immediate local level, that's where it's impacting us. So people from both sides, the New York and the Connecticut side, are rightfully so. What, what, really what about, upset about uh, that. the Merritt Parkway? That that as well? You know, I didn't read about it on hmm. the Merritt Parkway, but oh my God, that would be awful. Yeah. That would be awful. Well, you know, th- they have a new way of doing it now, though. Nobody I know, has at a high stop. speed. And, but no one got that memo. <laughs> and you really, uh, my brother reminded me the other day that that was the whole reason why we got rid of the, the tolls in the first place was yes. because of the huge accident that happened at the Milford uh, stop. Uh, I think a truck ran into a bunch of cars. Really? How long ago? Um, back when we got rid of the the tolls. Wow. Um, that was really the impetus for it. I mean, nobody liked the tolls, but... You know, I think the argument always is if you see the money going back into the infrastructure and you see visible improvements on your roadways, then anybody would be happy to comply, but you don't see the results. Um, you could, you know, think of many roadways. Go over to New York, the Long Island Expressway, I think has been a work in progress for, I don't know how many years now. And now they want to build that tunnel. Um, But the toll that is proposed, um, there's a lot of discrepancy on both sides of the aisle. Governor Malloy have placed an indefinite hold on it for a while um, as the special transportation fund in the state was going into the red and it would be impossible to sell bonds and fund and finance the project. Um, And construction trade unions were afraid this is going to cause an outward migration of construction workers into other states. There was a lot of Back and forth. And I know Fred was at, uh, Representative Camillo was at a rally the other day that I saw on Facebook that he's really advocating the stopping of this plan. So we want to hear from him. Some local residents from Greenwich joined him. And here he is. And he brought me a protein water from outside. <laughs> Tris, I like it. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome. We, we learned the art of improv this morning. <laughs> I was listening to you. And the tolls did come out around 87 because of the accident in Stratford. So 1980. So we've lived this long. 87. 87. Okay. So we've lived 30 years without them. Yeah, and unfortunately they are scheduled to go on the uh, Merritt Parkway. On the Merritt. No, there's your answer. But there will be pushback on that. All right. So let's talk. Let's start from the beginning. So Malloy had placed an indefinite hold on this. So how are we here? How have we gotten here? Well, they. to make a long story short, I know we only have a few minutes, but... The when the tolls came the time out, time is all yours, Fred. <laughs> it is. <laughs> we have session today, unfortunately. Um, this well, is more enjoyable than that. I have to it it right? certainly <laughs> is. We're voting on judges, so that's okay. This is much more interesting. The um, one of the stipulations when the tolls came out in the late '80s was that we would get federal funding, and if we put them back, we would lose the federal funding. That was one of our main arguments against putting them back. Uh, but about six or seven years ago, that stipulation was taken off, so was removed. So you would no longer lose the federal funding if you replaced the toll. Right. So we lost that argument. That was a, that was a key one. But I always go back to the fact that we raid the special transportation fund every single year. Mm-hmm. Uh, even this governor has done it every year while, in the same breath, saying that he wants a lockbox on the special transportation fund, meaning that 
the legislature could not raid those funds to pay bills and, and put them divert the money to the general fund. So without the law, and it's going to be on the, the ballot this year. Okay. So people uh, will have a chance in November to vote on this. They will. And we, I'm waiting to see exactly what's on, how it's written on the ballot. Hopefully it's, they haven't um, added things into it to make it uh, less attractive. But certainly we're hoping it, it is what it is and it says what it's going to do. And it's pretty simple and to the point. So it would be a no-brainer to vote for it. Absent that, I would not vote. Uh, even consider discussing the tolls because, again, there's no guarantee that they will not raid those funds again. Even though they're Absolutely. saying they can't do this, but they... Well, there's a lot of things that they couldn't do and they, they managed to do, and you'll find yourself back in the red in your special transportation fund and just extra congestion on your roadways and really an inconvenience that will make people think of alternate routes and people get creative when it comes to avoiding tolls. Yeah, and at the uh, rally on Saturday, State Senator Joe Markley brought up a study that was done that showed if they do what they're proposing to do and you have a just a 10-mile commute, it would cost you an extra $1,000 a year, just a 10-mile commute wow. all within Connecticut. So if you have, like, uh, um, um, Representative Bacino and... Senator France and Representative Florin and I have today a commute of 85 miles or so each way. It would get pretty expensive. Absolutely. So um, we're, you know, lots, ha lots of things have to be worked out. We, for those who say, well, we should not charge Connecticut residents and just charge the other people. Yes, I did read something about How would you even distinguish? Is it just they would pick up the plate at that point because those new high-speed towers? Yeah, but it's unfortunately it's a violation of interstate commerce, so you, yeah, absolutely. you can't do that. But you can give some type of a, of a break uh, discount. Like some type of incentive or some type of recognition for in-state drivers. Sure. Because they said, some, I read somewhere when I was reading about this ahead of your arrival, that they, they say it's about 40% of Connecticut residents are, account for the traffic on the roadways and about 60% of outsiders that <clears throat> would be impacted by using the tolls. I don't know how they even would calculate those well, figures. Well, yeah, they're throwing all different statistics out. The last one I saw was that 30% um, of the revenue would come from out-of-state drivers. Now it's seventy percent Connecticut. Oh, numbers so, are changing. Yeah, and I, I don't know at this point. I don't know how they came to those numbers, so it's hard to really get worked up and comment too much on it. But again, if, if we don't work out the 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 rating issue, and also I would like to see the the um, way stations kept open more. When the state troopers had them, they were open a lot, and they were, it was a cash cow. So what happened there? Because you don't see them open regularly, for sure. Uh, who Under whose purview are they? Whose control? Good question. Oh, sure, I'm glad we under asked. Under whose pure purview is that? That was it, a big word of the day. It <laughs> is, and it is um, it is now under the uh, jurisdiction of the Department of Motor Vehicles. Okay. And one, one of the things, when Governor Rell tried to do this many years ago, uh, we fought back and, and prevented it because we were arguing not only is it are they bringing in a lot of revenue for out of, from out of state truckers uh, and, and other uh, vehicles, but also it was a public safety issue that they're, they're the first line of defense coming in from other states. Yes, and uh, you know of course they have the powers of arrest, the state troopers, and the since DMV workers took it over. Um, we haven't had the revenue we had before. It seems to be closed now more than it's open. And I just wonder how equipped they are if, if God forbid, there was something, a big incident. And we've had, uh, unfortunately, in Greenwich, going back to the 70s, shootouts over there really? on the border. Um, uh, yeah, and uh, uh, I know um, former police officer James Fahey, if he's listening, he was involved in that. And uh, lots of people remember that. And it's, it just goes without saying. You really want public safety to come first, but also the revenue they brought in was an added bonus, and it's just not happening now. So It seems so simple on its surface. I mean, listen, any time you tie in the initials DMV anywhere, everybody's going to get a little upset. Well, we, we could really just do a whole show on that, and everyone's going to grin and say, are you kidding me? I mean, it's hard enough to navigate through the line to get your driver's license. It's just not an efficient <laughs> process. So why not turn the control back over to the necessary hands or into the troopers? The only thing I could think of, Jen, is that it was probably a money issue 
maybe overtime. Overtime and staffing the troopers. I think the troopers probably cost a little bit more. However, I've, they brought in more money. Well, yeah, exactly. You can see on a cost-benefit analysis your revenue is coming in. So roughly how often is the way station, are the way stations open? You know, I don't know because... Weekly, uh, you know, monthly? When I, I know years ago when I lived in, on the western side of town, I know when I had a business in town many years ago, I was there every day and it was open every single day. In fact, I remember we had a, uh, a waste disposal and recycling business, and I remember 4 o'clock in the morning we would have radios in the truck and you would hear in the CBs all the truckers talking on the East Coast asking if the way station was open, and if it was open, they used to go around on the post road. Um, so, but it was open fairly often, and when I go by, it's usually not open. But right. I'm not there every day now because I'm more going towards right. So, I mean, we open. know it's not open with the same consistency and regularity. So, yeah, no, it, it's definitely not. Some people say it's closed all the time. I, you know, I asked DMV and they disputed that this week. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if they gave me the correct information because they said said it's open all the time, which I do not. No, I certainly, I I vouch for that as well. Well, again, but you are offering other solutions. There are other ways to put money back into the transportation fund without these excessive inconveniences. You know, it seems to be, you know, when you come in, and we love having you here as a guest, but there's kind of a a recurring message. They don't get it up in Hartford. The taxes, the, the punitive nature, the excessive fees, they're not keeping people here. No, and if you listen to the governor's state of the state address a couple of weeks ago, not once did he me- mention the economy, not once did he mention jobs. It was all about wedge issues and social issues and gender equity. And, you know, those are things you talk about after you've Fix, solved, yeah, absolutely. solved the economy. And it e- either he's thrown in the towel or he's just deflecting away from the record because the record, as I always quote, former New York Giants coach Bill Parcells, who always says, you are what your record says you are. Absolutely. And, you know, all the blaming and finger pointing uh, that's done at the end of the day, you got to stand on your record and what happened on your watch. And it's been a disaster the last eight years. I, it's, I mean, the, it's certainly the effects of it trickle down to every level, and they're very yeah. visible. Now, he's not seeking re-election in November, correct? He, no, he's not. And I mean, he can, mostly economically, when I say it's been a disaster, um, you know, there have been some things I think that he's done pretty well. And, you know, it wasn't – he came into office during the – rece- you know, af- a year after the recession. So the cause wasn't his, his fault. It's just how he reacted to it. Absolutely. When you, when you try to – you have revenue grabs all the time and, and huge tax increases, people – people leave with their – you know, vote with their feet. They leave. And now they can't dispute it. When I remember speaking with him the first week he was in office in his, in his office and he – uh he didn't believe it, you know, and, and not – he wasn't being wise. He just did not believe that people – the narrative that people were leaving. He just thought it was a Republican campaign um, campaign rhetoric. But now it's facts and disputed. Well, he the, can't – no one can deny it now. The corporations themselves, uh, you know, the General Electric, was that under his watch or was that prior it, to it, that? It was. They were – and he had help with this because he had – you know, the former speaker made a comment about them bluffing the um, – the one I think it was the Senate Majority Leader made a comment, and somebody else said th- about them, you know, staying a few weekends off their yachts down there in, in the <laughs> Gold Coast, and that will make up the difference. Those were sa- and and so of course, G read that stuff. They had sent us an email saying, "Don't do this," and not only do we do these taxes, we make them retroactive. So the warning was there. So there are some people say, "Well, you know, they Boston was more attractive." And absolutely, but. There was an email. There is a trail yeah. saying, "Don't they do this." They fired a warning shot. On they that, fired. Sure. They gave us a war, uh, you know fear warning saying, "If you do, if you pass this, we will form a s- exploratory committee." And they did. And it was was it a relatively quick process once they put their wheels in motion? I mean, start Fairly. to finish, they yeah. were out pretty quick. It seems we all heard rumors. Um, some people would, would go in public with them. I didn't because I you never know what's true and right. what's not true, but. Judging by the the email we did see, you know, I had to think something was up. And, um, of course, uh, they did go, and they're not the only ones. But I also I worry about the, the people, um, not just the rich people, which take an awful lot with them when they leave, but also the middle-class people are going, and 
while they may not have the the net worth of of the wealthier ones leaving they also they kind of make up for it sometimes with their sweat equity with their civic absolutely spirit absolutely they all contribute to to a network and a system and a cycle that keep mm-hmm. communities going so Really, discuss the climate then, the economic climate outside Fairfield County. Is it true that Fairfield County really pulls the state and really carries the weight and shoulders the financial burden for the state? Yeah, it does. I mean, Connecticut has long relied on the financial and defense industries. Um, Now, since 2008, we've found out what happens when the financial industry takes a hit. So one of the things we tried to do up there, and I do give the governor credit, he did uh, agree with this, to look to bioscience as another sector to kind of, you know, establish a niche in. And how do you make that attractive? Is it through your education systems and your <coughs> collegiate programs? Do you start at that level, or how do you entice them to come in? Great question. It's multi-leveled, um, certainly, you know, through course offerings and, and, and gearing your workforce to meet the need, but also um, through it, the tax expenditures, meaning offers to companies to come in, um, I was one of five Republicans to vote for Jackson Labs because it was a $300 million price tag. And the opponent said, well, it's $300 million for 300 jobs. But it really, they missed the point because there was a ripple-down effect. Other businesses were being helped by that. And we were able to get in there, if Joe Calico is listening out there, his famous Calico Clause, which was mm-hmm. um, if these companies that we give money to strike it big and they hit a home run with a product, at some point, and in the case of Jackson Labs, it was $10 million, the state taxpayer becomes a 50% partner. So in rem, you know, the example of, in rem, of Remicade in New York, New York State, they kicked back $3 billion to the taxpayers in New York. So they're getting the money from us, and like anything else, at some point, if, if they make a few million dollars, they don't know anything. And if certainly if they lose money, they don't own anything. But if you're really making a lot of money, the people – it's like you know, venture capitalists and yeah. somebody who gives you're you money. Just, you're putting it back <clears throat> in, back into to your home, to your home base. Yeah. Um, and a case certainly to be made for that. Um, let's discuss some <clears throat> other initiatives that are going on up in Hartford. So in light of the awful, horrific, and, and tragic events of last week uh, down in Parkland, Florida, you know, everybody goes <clears throat> right to gun control. And – it's a tough issue. You know, personally, I align with the Second Amendment and the right to bear arms, but checks and balances for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and there is such a thing as a mental health crisis in this country. Um, he is seeking more gun control. Is he actively pushing <coughs> something at the present? Or do you think that this is something that's kind of a, a talking point right now that won't come to fruition? More of a talking point. Uh, I haven't seen anything uh, specific. Certainly, we have one of the... the toughest gun laws in the country. Uh, for the most part, I think it's worked out well. I, I think that the, the violence is down, and I think that, you know, we did miss uh, the boat a little bit with the, you know, we could have done more, I think, with uh, mental health. But it was a start. And like you, I'm a Second Amendment person. There are a lot of people now who, you know, right off the bat, they go to the gun control. Yeah. And and, it's a deeper and, issue here. It's a much deeper issue. You know, the issue. person who goes through the permit process and, and rightfully bears the arm and protects it in their home, they're not the problem. They're not the problem at all. Not at all. Um, you know, down there, there certainly is a case that a lot was missed on him. And <clears> I can't <throat> imagine a check that, that the suspect would have cleared that would have allowed him that firearm and the FBI warnings. You know, there's always going to be a, a chain of uh, the, yeah. a chain of fault or where the chain broke. But the overall... You know, you have to just let the dust settle and see the issue clearly for what it is. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. There, there was certainly a breakdown um, by the FBI, by the oh, local, yes. the local police. Um, there were n- uh, tons of red flags with with this guy. That being said, I mean, I, ha- I kind of share the same view as Ronald Reagan had on it. Um, all the gun laws in the world aren't going to stop maniacs. Absolutely. I mean, they'll do. They'll create bombs. They'll do. They'll other, find other ways. I mean, find, look at nine eleven. It was uh, homemade yeah. bombs and, and plastic Air, knives in, from the airplane yeah. that they held people. Box cutters. With. Box cutters. Yeah. So, but also, uh, what Ronald Reagan said was, you know, you don't really need to be walking around with an AK forty seven. And Correct. Um, I think those are common sense things that most people agree on. Background checks. Um, you don't need the crazy uh, high uh, uh, volume uh, weapons you know i'm not even a hunter because i love animals but i get that uh, if people are not doing it for you know right. trophy uh, hunting 
I get it. I don't like it, but I get it. And right, I respect absolutely. It. And like you respect you, the right. And, and, and yeah, I, I've had a, I had a friend who was a New York City cop who's now, uh, I believe, a judge. And he told me he is not a Republican, and he's certainly not a big fan of high-capacity weapons. But he, when we were debating the gun bill in 2013, he said, whatever you do, don't vote to, di- to disarm the citizenry. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, when I was a cop, there were many instances where there were some neighborhoods that just went up and there were riots. And because it was so dangerous, our commanding officers told us to pull back. So the people were left there. They had no defense. Wow. And if you remember... It's a frightening in ni- scenario. Well, if you remember in 1992 during the uh, L.A. riots, mm-hmm. in the Korean section, the Korean shop owners went on the roofs with their with their guns. Now, I don't think they shot anybody, but they didn't... Those those buildings were not touched. Right. So they... Because they, they, in those areas, there, was, there were no police. Mm-hmm. They couldn't go in. So... I would never, ever, ever vote to take to to chip away at the right of somebody to protect themselves. But I think there's some things we can do to lessen the chances of these things happening. Yes, common sense uh, laws. So but I just some you know I laugh at the same, and I hate to use the word politician because I think it's uh, it's become a degrading term now, and it shouldn't be. But there are certain people, especially some on the federal level in Connecticut, that sent out fundraiser letters, our two U.S. senators, after Sandy Hook and I th- believe after Las Vegas, both of them, using the tragedies to raise money. That's awesome. So send it to me, keep voting for me, because I'm the one that's going to fight for gun. So they used a tragedy, and they ought to be ashamed of themselves. And you see it happening. You know, it got, I think this, one of the saddest things was the reaction to Parkland, that within moments, you know, you go on social media, and it really, it has its finger on the pulse of, of the social climate, and within moments it was, you know, the, how the hell with your prayers and, and, and you know, prayers. Condescending, and con- yeah. Condescending, and yeah. where we have come as a nation and where the political divide now falls, I think is a very sad commentary. But using it for self-gain and political gain and political advancement, and it's very easy to do when you have such a malleable population, when you have people with so much... Anger. And if you look on, I mean, social media is great to catch up with old friends and to look at what people are doing. Yes. There are many dangers that come with it, too. It's a double-edged sword. Absolutely. And one of the things is a lot of misinformation gets put out there, and I see, you know, dear friends doing it sometimes. (laughs) It's hard to keep those friends. And and you really, yeah, it's it's all you can do to, you know, sometimes. not hit on friends. (laughs) Well, sometimes I'll send them a private message and say, you know, rather than, post something there and, and try to embarrass somebody just to say, listen, check your facts before you post things. Absolutely. It's a very good public service announcement to a friend. You know, there's ways even to continue on a civil discourse with somebody on the opposite side. And that's what I feel is missing from the political arena. I agree. The, the vitriol that has come, you know, in the days of Ronald Reagan, there, there were in intellectual, intelligent debates between both sides of the aisle. And we're just not there anymore. No, we're not. And I think there you know, in, in ta- the town of Greenwich, it, it was always civil until the last few years, and we've had some candidates running for office that were, you know, have a scorched earth policy, mm-hmm. didn't, would lie and then get called on and then double down on the lies, and then they were criticizing President Trump for doing the same thing, and while the all the while they're doing the same exact uh, uh, try, type of campaigning. So, but there are some I, the majority of people I still think are good. Um, you know, I. I'll even plug my friend John Blankley if he's out there listening. He's him and I. We, you know, he's a Democrat. I'm a Republican. He's now running for treasurer in the state of Connecticut. But we have just a, a great time, a great dialogue. We can debate civilly and laugh and still have a beer at the end of the day. That's what, and, and that's the way uh, it should be. It's former nice Selectman Marzullo was mm-hmm. like that, um, and that's the way it should be, as you said. But you know, what I fear a lot of people who come into a town, whether it's Greenwich or not, and they may not, they may have ambitions for office which is great but they have no connection no respect no um feel for the tradition of the of the town and the spirit of which it's been long run and they just bring in these tactics in from uh, other places and you know and then it it creates you know a lot of dissension so but you know at the end of the day you can't even if you're uh the nicest of people and, and, and you're in office you can't always turn your, your the, you know, the other cheek no. all the time because that doesn't work either. No. So you, you have to answer these, you know, whatever it is that they're they're charging you with. 
And then pivot and go back on your message, which you hope to be positive and inclusive, and to run on your record with a vision towards the future. That's what I think is missing a lot. And uh, I just hope that I try to encourage everybody to, to get involved and to run for office, but to do it the right way. Well, you're certainly a model of, of what you just spoke about. So in our closing minutes, Fred, can you tell us anything that you're currently working on, any legislation that you're actively pushing for? Sure. Um, there's so so many bills up there uh, right now. But we just had a press conference yesterday um, on some animal welfare bills. Oh, wonderful. Including, and we can't go through them all now, but one of them was uh, I put into to basically a Good Samaritan law. So if there's a, a pet or a child, it's, it's in the languages in there, the bill, that's it locked in a car in extreme oh. weather situations, both hot and cold, that you would not get in trouble if you broke the window to, to rescue the pet or the child. Um, that Somebody tried it before and it, it failed, but we're going to – it's a short session, so it makes it even harder, but we're certainly going to try. It's common sense. <clears throat> it's common sense on the surface. I mean, I, I don't know what, what evidence or statistics the lawmakers are looking for. You know, it should just be something that you do without <clears throat> without thinking. But well, you know, it's unfortunately you'll have a couple people um, who may sit as chairman of certain committees, and if they don't like a bill or a subject or a, a, a legislator, mm. and and you know, usually when you have bills yourself, you it it compels them to act nice and to to try to get along <laughs> and to at least um, compromise. But some of them don't have any bills in, so of course they have nothing to lose. Exactly. So they'll go after your bills. Um, you see this all the time, and it's 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 too bad because it's sometimes you know fifty percent of something is better than a hundred percent of nothing. Absolutely. Well, I do hope that you get that bill passed. And I thank, well, thank you, you for coming. A little disappointed you didn't bring Teddy. Everyone suggested maybe he was coming next yeah, time. If I wasn't going to Hartford, I would have brought him. <laughs> Teddy in Hartford, that's the next thing. Yeah. <laughs> Fred Camillo, thank you for all the great work that you do in keeping our citizens safe, well-informed, and well-represented up in Hartford. Well, and this thank is, you. Thank you. This is Jen Graziano thanking you for taking the time to listen as we took the time to talk. Have a great day, Greenwich.